So let's, let's start. Around 120 years ago, two sanitary engineers, Hiram Mills in the US and Julius Reinke in Germany, independently of each other, made observations that provision of clean tap water to homes prevented not only diarrheal deaths of small children, but per prevented diarrheal death additional two to four deaths uh, seemingly unrelated to bad hygiene, for example, respiratory deaths, measles, etc., were also prevented. The first men mention of this enigmatic Mil mills reinke phenomenon in literature is a paper published in Science in 1908. mills reinke phenomenon was widely known and appreciated before World War II among public health experts. It gave impetus to urban sanitary policies until the 1960s, when the now decaying water and sanitation infrastructure was finally fina finalized in the rich countries. Although mills reinke phenomenon became forgotten after World War II, its, contents, its content resurfaced without reference uh, to it in the classic 1968 World Health Organization monograph, Interactions of Nutrition and Infection, written by Harvard nutritionists. They systematized a huge literature on the subject matter which showed that practically all infections in childhood affect adversely nutritional status of children, especially repeated diarrheal episodes before age one result in permanent irreversible undernutrition, i.e. stunting. Before World War II, it was already a common practice in public health to recommend various vitamin supplementations and even ultraviolet to boost vitamin D levels among children living in urban, poor urban environments in today's rich countries. This policy is again flourishing in vitamin supplementation programs such as A vitamin programs in the developing countries. Harvard nutritionists claim, stressing the need to provide hygienic environment to, in, to ensure uh, proper nutrition of small children was too much to many. The idea was viciously attacked by the rising tide of neo-Malthusian thinking, stressing the importance of food security. Dramatic TV images of severe famine episodes around the globe in the 1970s and 1980s uh, and uh, effectively disseminated population bomb fears helped to forget the importance of hygienic environments to public health. When the WHO monograph in 1968 was published, a limited analytic uh, epidemiological evidence to back up the infection malnutrition link further helped to forget the idea. And now there has been a rocky road of the mills reinke phenomenon to new appreciation in the era of Paris Agreement. In this report published 10 years ago, we summarized evidence from all by then published cohort and case control studies of how infections impact children's subsequent nutritional status. I find the evidence from these studies and all the abundant indirect clinical, ecological, and experimental laborat laboratory evidence compelling. Ten years ago, expert panels within WHO made a rough estimate that 50% of consequences of undernutrition are attributable to bad hygiene. Undernutrition is an acquired immunodeficiency, which increases child mortality to infectious diseases. This infection-nutrition interaction is the likely explanation to, the Mil uh, to, to Mr. Mills and Mr. Reinken's enigmatic observations over 100 years ago. The final blow to the idea that institutional environmental health action to control infections and parasites should be the first priority did not come from science, but from the suddenly popular conservation ideology and fears of doom and gloom. I have strong detailed evidence to support this view in my essay published in the website of the American Council on Science and Health in autumn 2017. I wrote the paper over a 10-year period and offered it to more than half a dozen medical journals for five years, but it was also always rejected without peer review. Mother of sustainability, i.e., my colleague and Norway, Norway's then Prime Minister, Gru Harlem Brundtland, although having an MPH from Harvard, 
when chairing World Commission on Environment in the mid-1980s, was personally responsible for abandoning urban sanitary programs, i.e. institutional environmental health, from the development agenda. This was to have devastating health consequences in the developing world, but not in the developed world, where little known and appreciated institutional environmental health is alive, although it became under-resourced in many countries compared to suddenly popular institutional environment protection. The rich countries were simply hooked to these environmental health practices supported by robust energy infrastructure and coal chain because they had revolutionized public health. Later on, Dr. Brundtland became director general of the WHO, World Health Organization. Let me try to explain to you the very foundations of environmental health with this figure. From the holy triangle of water, sanitation, and hygiene, the now dirty H word, i.e. hygiene, is in the epicenter. This is something I did not learn comprehensively at medical school, though aseptic and hygienic principles were stressed in various subjects, for example, surgery, obstetrics, pediatrics, nosocomial infection control, etc. Nor did I learn to fully appreciate hygienic principles when I worked as a public health researcher and vaccinologist for years. Nor did I learn these foundations in my American alma mater, although when I studied there in the 19, early 1990s, this world-renowned institution was still carrying proudly the H word in its name. UN, UN Sustainable Development Goal, i.e. clean water and sanitation, does not mention the dirty H word. And I think it tells us a lot that the word hygiene is replaced by New York City Mayor Michael, Michael uh, Bloomberg's name when he donated large sums to Johns Hopkins School of Hygiene and Public Health. Sustainable Development 3, which tells us how to reduce child mortality does not mention the dirty word, uh, dirty word either. At maximum in leaflets or campaigns or even in the scientific reports of supposedly high quality published in The Lancet, hygiene has become to equate, equate only hand washing. I came to appreciate this now forbidden H word in the World Bank where I was hired to tell the bank and its clients what institutional environmental health is. One of the first lessons during the steep learning curve was to get rid of the conceptual mistake common even among specialists that drinking water would be the vehicle of diarrheal transmission. World Bank's fecal point, Pete Kolsky's rule number one of environmental health in the developing countries, shit is everywhere and especially in the wrong place help to learn away from this conceptual mistake. In this figure, it is illustrated that only around 20 to 25 percent of childhood diarrheal episodes would be prevented if provision of clean water, drinking water in unhygienic condition is secured. World Health Organization's recommendation, which tells us that everybody should be able to consume water about 200 liters per day, became a taboo in political declarations of, of sustainable development. To secure this level of consumption is, however, ever crucial if we want to prevent effectively diarrheal disease in the developing world, as you can see from the figure. So you see that the real reduction of a diarrheal disease, which is crucial, crucial when we think of undernutrition, malnutrition, is that there is enough water the, 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 the political declarations, the trust is in drinking water, which only drops diarrhea rate around 20 to 25 percent. The big reduction is through hygiene. Think of your everyday life. You w wake up in the morning, you have uh, clean laundry, you have clean utensils, you have uh, food that has been processed uh, safely, and has been stored safely, you uh, are doing your hygienic uh, uh, everyday, everyday practices, etc., etc., you use a lot of water. 
And now we have in uh, developed countries a very, very low endemic rate. And here uh, I tried to co correct this. The rotavirus vaccine hasn't actually dropped endemic rate, but what it has done now in Finland is that we no longer have diarrheal hospitalizations. So it's, it's no, no longer a problem. Water usage in quantity empowers the H word and makes our environment safe in the developed world along with sanitation infrastructure. It is the guarantor that we today, today live longer, are one head taller and cognitively better equipped than our ancestors. Even during the drought of 2015 and under what were called severe water restrictions, environmentally conscious Californians per capita daily domestic usage of water was brought down to 500 liters, i.e. even then they belong to the world's top water consumers. Today there is also another taboo in the development agenda, namely the so-called energy ladder. This very useful concept was introduced to WHO realm already 30 years ago. It was initially hailed, but when fears of perceived dangers of increasing carbon intensity, while the poor climbed this, uh, the ladder to achieve better indoor and hence also outdoor air quality, were forcefully introduced, this concept finally vanished from the development agenda. Here is a Finnish smoke hut from the 19th century. This smoke hut's stove resembles contemporary rural dwellings stoves in China. It does not have a chimney, although it has a huge, large stove. During several decades of economic growth, which accelerated after World War II, Finland, along with other industrialized countries, climbed the ladder to the top. This abolished once and for all today's by far the most important global pollution problem, i.e. indoor air pollution in the developing countries. Almost all WHOs now declared 7 million global air pollution attributable deaths are ultimately attributable to decentralized heating and cooking using dirty solid fuels. This, despite this, a standard visual message or a written message of the WHO or of a prominent former UN climate bureaucrat or of the prestigious journal Lancet, when these actors promote awareness of air pollution through mass media, is to erroneously present power generating plants as the main source of air pollution. It's coming from decentralized heating and cooking. That's the real, the real origin of the, uh, of the problem. The indoor air problem, although acknowledged, will still uh, will remain unaddressed because, in practice, Paris Agreement denies poorest people access to cleaner fuels and power grid, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. I will not go into further details to this pervasive problem, as we will certainly discuss this after presentations, but I will tell how the indoor air problem and the H-word issue are intimately interconnected, at least in two ways. First, if the global development community was serious about protecting the poor's health, it would have to accept the fact that to solve the indoor air problem requires a grid that also is a prerequisite for water provisions to home. And the only cost-effective means to power the grid is to use coal now. Secondly, if the poor, severely ill child was not in the first place undernourished because of bad hygiene, he or she would have better survival chances. In summary, there is now risk that the poor will be denied access to affordable clean fossil fuels, affordable clean coal te technology and power grid which enable clean air water and sanitation infrastructure, and cold chain. Cold chain, another forgotten cornerstone of environmental health practice, as it is vital to food safety, is also vital when de delivering, uh, for example, measles vaccinations globally. It needs a cold chain. 
Measles vaccinations have uh, only since the turn of the millennium saved 15.6 million children, children's life, according to the United Nations. Now, as environmental health continues to be neglected, and even over 200 million people could die prematurely by 2050. The ultimate irony of all this, according to IPCC, is that environmental health is pivotal when we think of climate adaptation needs of societies. Thank you for your attention.